This is the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com and ConstructionBusinessAccelerator.com. My name is Todd DeWalt. It's my job to help you, the construction business owner, maximize revenue and eliminate chaos. I've got a great interview with a friend and a client of mine. His name is Toby Jones. He's a commercial general contractor in Michigan. And here's what you're going to learn. Toby's going to share with you how he's able to get work without bidding against anyone. That's something you'd like to know, right? Uh, You're also going to find out why he paid $10,000 for a phone number and why he would do it again in a heartbeat. He'll talk about how his business really got started in a bookstore. It all started in a Borders bookstore. You'll find out why he prefers commercial over residential. And then he'll give you his number one piece of advice that will make you rethink how you manage your projects and your clients. Before we get into that, a couple of resources I want to get into your hands. If you've listened to me, you know that my philosophy on managing projects and teams is that your job as the leader is to be the broker of information, get the right information to the right people at the right time, at the right level of detail. And one of the best ways to do that is with text messaging. And one of the best ways to do that is with field chat. It is the ultimate text messaging platform for construction sites. That's what it's for. Helping you manage your communications with text messaging on on construction sites. What it does is it automatically organizes all of your text messaging by project, giving you an organized, searchable history of all your messages. Wouldn't that be nice? It also integrates with some of the big platforms out there like PlanGrid and Procore. So what it means to you is less rework, fewer mistakes, less chaos, which is going to give you more time and help you make more money. Does that sound good? So if you're looking for the ultimate way to manage text messaging, to manage the flow of communication on your job sites, you need to check out Field Chat. And a few pieces of good news. As a Construction Leading Edge podcast listener, you can get 15% off. All you have to do is go to fieldchat.com slash edge, E-D-G-E. And you may even be eligible for a free account. So go to fieldchat.com slash edge and get signed up for Field Chat and start managing the flow of communication. The next thing I want to tell you about is something that Toby and I are going to talk about a little bit in this interview, and it's my live event that's coming up, The Advance. You can find out all the details over at constructionbusinessaccelerator.com slash advance. It's a live two-day event, October 17th and 18th in beautiful Lexington, Kentucky. What's in it for you? All right. Here's what's in it for you. The one thing, there's there's a bunch of stuff you're going to learn, but I want to highlight one thing. And one thing you're going to walk away from the advance with is you're going to have tools and strategies that will help you sell more work at higher margins. Let me say that again. You will walk away from the advance with strategies and tools and words you can say to your clients that will help you sell more work at higher margins. You'll be able to overcome, maybe even prevent the price objection. You'll even learn strategies that will help you avoid having to bid on work. Wouldn't it be nice to just be able to negotiate contracts? You'll learn strategies on how to build relationships and who you really need to build build those relationships with as well. Ryan Hammers is a business owner who came to my last advance in April, and he said he walked away with strategies, and here's what he said. I thought that we needed to hire two more sales reps, but in fact, all we needed to do is a better job of qualifying our prospects. So you're gonna learn some powerful techniques that you can use that you could be just like Ryan, where you could save, you could avoid hiring more sales reps, run fewer estimates, make more money. That's what you're gonna get. So you're gonna learn how to sell more work at higher margins. In in addition to that, you're gonna learn how to systematize your business. You're gonna learn how to lead your team to higher profitability. And you're also gonna learn how to get out of your own way and stop screwing yourself over, okay? Those are the big buckets of content we're gonna cover. And then maybe the most important thing that's even better than all of that content will be the relationships that you'll develop with 
a group of like-minded, smart, generous, successful, hardworking construction business owners just like you who will share what's working for them and will help you grow your business. There are relationships, as Toby's going to talk about in this interview today, that uh, were developed at the last advance that still continue on today. So check it out, constructionbusinessaccelerator.com slash advance. Registration closes October 13th. So go grab your spot for the advance over at constructionbusinessaccelerator.com slash advance. And I'll see you in Lexington, Kentucky. Now let's get to my interview with Toby Jones. All right, Toby, thanks for being on the podcast. How's it going today? Going well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we met um, in person back in April 2019. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But um, uh, there's, I'm really glad that you agreed to come on the podcast. I think you've got a lot, a lot to offer. You've got questions. You have answers to a lot of the questions that people ask me. We're going to talk about relationships and how you've been able to leverage those relationships and really grow your business how you've made the jump from residential to commercial, how you've overcome some adversity and some expensive mistakes we're going to talk about. So uh, I'm looking forward to this. So let's, let's start, let's start here. So one of the interesting things about your business is you've got a couple of different things you're doing. How did you get into the home inspection business? And then we'll talk about your, the, uh, the commercial work that you're doing, but how did you get into the home inspection business? Well, I, uh, I was working for a large commercial contractor at the time and I was, I was traveling all over the world or United States. And, um, I was, I was missing my kids and I, I just didn't like the work we were doing. I didn't like the way the, the company was run. Um, I just, I was miserable. So I was out of town, um, in Nebraska. And I went to a Borders bookstore. Uh, well, first of all, I, I thought, what could I do to, to get out of this company and start something on my own? So I, I typed in uh, the Google bar, uh, businesses you, you can start uh, with the construction background, and Home Inspector popped up. So I, I drove to Borders um, from the hotel and, and bought this book, How to Start Your Own Home Inspection Company. So I, I kind of started the company while I was at this um, commercial company I was working for, and it, it really didn't take off. Um, I was trying to do a few on the side at night on weekends and stuff, and I, I did a few, but it just, to get in with realtors that have been using the same inspector for years, it's kind of hard. Um, you know, how many inspections have you done? Well, two. They didn't, you know, they didn't take me seriously. And, you know, even though I have a strong construction background and knew what I was looking at, you know, took a home inspection course past that, had, you know, certifications and things that just, they, they didn't really welcome me. So um, I, I decided to take the leap uh, to get out of this company and start my own business. And at that time I was, I was buying a house and uh, so I hired a home inspector mainly to uh, follow him around and, and see how he did things. And okay. So I hired him, followed him around. And when we were done with the inspection, I said, you know, I, I, I've got business cards with, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a home inspector too. Can you give me any tips? And we, we hit it off. Um, this guy was in the seventies. He was, he'd, he'd been a home inspector for, you know, 30 years and uh, kind of the same background I had. He's just older and, you know, he'd, he'd done thousands of them. So we hit it off and he offered his advice and then he offered to let me tag along with him on a few inspections. So I did that and uh, saw how he was doing things and still my home inspection business didn't take off, but I, I was on my own doing commercial construction at this time. And he called me out of the blue one day and he said, Hey, I'm getting ready to retire. He said, why don't you buy my business? And I said, well, 
what what's your business you know you, you've got a ladder and a <laughs> few tools and stuff and i said i already have that stuff so what what am i buying he said my phone number's been in the book the phone book for 30 years and every realtor has it stored in their phone in jackson michigan that's where i'm that's where i'm from oh, and i said what how much how much for your phone number and he said ten thousand dollars and i just I about fell off my chair. I thought, man, that's, that's a lot of money for a phone number. So I said, his name was Gary. I said, Gary, uh, how about this? I'll give you 5,000 for your phone number. And then within a year, I'll pay the other five. And he said, that's a deal. So I did. I bought that phone number, went down to the Verizon store, had that number, um, put on another phone and then I had that phone forwarded to my current phone. And the first month with that phone number, I did 30 inspections at $300 a piece. So that was $9,000 <laughs> pure profit that pretty much almost paid for the phone number. And from there it just took off. Every realtor was calling me. They're asking for Gary. I explained that I, I bought his business. And so I, I still get calls from that that number still, and it's been since 2012 is when I bought it. So that was probably the best $10,000 investment I've ever made in my life. So how much do you, if you were, if you were to sell that phone number now, would you sell it for $10,000? Oh. Well, and, and he did, he gave me advice. He said, this phone number, he, he had a great reputation. Great. I mean, everyone loved the guy and he was a great inspector. And he, he also told me, I'm not going to sell it to anyone else. If, if you don't want it, I'm just going to let it go. Mm. So he, he really didn't need the money, but he wanted, I think he wanted me to spend money on that number because, um, take it more seriously, probably. Mm. Um, but if I was to sell that number now, I, I don't know. I, I think my number's worth, you know, now I'm him is the way I look at it. I've taken over his reputation and, and things in Jackson and, and people now look at me like they did him and which is, I was pretty proud of that. But he, uh, yeah, that was a great, <laughs> great investment for, for me. And that, you know, and we, and I don't worry, you want to go next, but that, that led to so much more that not just home inspections, but the people I've, the realtors I've met through that number, I don't know how many millions I've done in construction work just from that number too, because I do commercial building inspections, which turns into, you know, someone's looking to buy a commercial building and I'm like, Hey, I'm a, I do build outs. I do tenant improvements. I, this is my, right up my alley. I know what I'm looking at. I can, I can do a turnkey project for you here. So that's turned into a lot of dollars in construction and just, you know, the realtors, um, commercial realtors that I, that I know there's a few good ones in Jackson that uh, someone from out of town will, you know, they have a, a franchise or a, you know, uh, for example, miracle ear is big up here, a hearing aid place. This, I did one this summer that was a guy from Grand Rapids about two and a half hours away. He owns eight of them. And he said, I heard you're the guy in Jackson to do my build out. I didn't have to bid against any other contractors. I didn't, I, I you know, I just slipped in there and did his build out. And a lot of the, my co competitors around here are wondering how I'm getting all this work. And uh, that's, you know, maybe that's back to your question about businesses. Um, you don't have to always do public work or bid against 10, 10 other contractors on a job. I, I don't even do that anymore. I just, hundred percent of my work is private. I do bid a, a few, you know, just to keep in practice public jobs and stuff. But if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I've, I've got enough work and enough relationships I've built through the years that the private stuff is where it's at in my eyes. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I definitely want to talk about the connection with the realtors and how, it, how that helped get you where you are today. But let's talk about where you're at today. What's, um, what kind of work are you doing right now? 
what size of projects, what does your company look like? Give us a, a little bit of a, a better picture of what today looks like for Jones Construction Solutions. Okay, well, um, when I first started, I, I did a, a couple residential projects in the mix the first few years in business, and I've totally eliminated all residential. Um, 100% commercial. Um, last summer, we, we built a, a large restaurant sports bar. Um, I do convenience stores with restaurants in them. Uh, I've, I've done car dealerships. Uh, I'm working at um, Spring Arbor University, Albion College. I do a lot of uh, locker room improvements, um, taking out the old metal lockers and, and putting in nice wooden lockers, and which helps with all the recruiting. Um, build outs are huge. Uh, I think we're really good at build outs. They're quick, they're profitable, they're, you know, the tenants just want to get in there and start making money. So we're, you know, we meet their schedule and um, the margins are good on those. And uh, I think we've got those down pretty good. Um, new buildings. Uh, we, we do a few new construction jobs, probably three or four a year, um, ranging, you know, 400,000 to a million. Uh, restaurants are usually two to three million. Car dealerships are two million. Um, so right now, it's a mix of strictly commercial stuff ranging from, you know, hundred thousand dollar jobs to 3 million. Um, my sales per year are, they vary depending on, you know, how big of the projects we get, but profit always seems to be about the same. Um, but it's, it's, we're right around three to 6 million in business per year. Okay. And you're a pretty lean operation, right? There's very lean. Um, <laughs> I have one full-time employee, believe it or not. So that's going to blow and, people away. Like how in the world is this guy doing that much work? With and, and I need, and I need to change things and I'm going to talk to you about that too, but um, I'm doing my books and everything still. I haven't found the right person. Yeah. I have a lot going on in my life, but um, I, I don't regret doing it though, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Cause I, I know it inside and out. So when I do hire somebody or, or sub it out, I can, uh, I know what, to, know what I'm looking at and you know, I, I can find a, a mistake or I can, I know what I'm looking at cause I've done it all, but I, it's time for me to let go of that and focus on sales. Um, so I, the, the one employee I have is, uh, he was a, um, competitor's employee that, that went out of business, but he was a commercial carpenter for 12 years. So he's a young guy, um, doesn't know the office stuff very well, but he's been with me for two years now. So he's, he's a project manager slash superintendent. And he's also uh, doing probably 90% of the home inspections now for me. So I let him do them on nights and weekends for extra money. And he, if he doesn't during the day, he's a salaried employee. So it's a good profit for me too. But it, I don't like to, I'm so busy right now doing everything. It's, it's hard for me to do the inspections as, as much as I was. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to let that side of my business go either. And it's, it's a good fit because he's, I would trust him to look at a house I was buying. So mm -hmm. I did do a hundred of them with him before I let him do them on his own. But that's a pretty um, good training process. Yeah, it is. You've seen everything after a hundred houses, <laughs> really. So he's, he's great. And every, all the feedback I get from him, from the other realtors and every, they said, I, I swear you did the inspection. It sounded like you talking to the clients, you know, the buyers, um, you know, after he did a hundred of them with me, he saw how to do it. And, uh, yeah, he I likes like doing it and it's really helped me out. That's great. I'd like to come back um, and, and talk about the key to, to finding, hiring, and training that PM superintendent because guys like that, guy, guys and gals at that position are extremely important for a small business and yes. it's a tricky spot. So I want to I come back and talk to that because I think you've got a lot to offer there. 
Um, but let's let's go back and talk about the, the transition, home inspection business to what's the connection between the home inspection business and all these relationships that you've developed doing commercial work? Because and I guess you're doing commercial inspections as well, but fill in the gap there. How did the home inspection business help you build relationships? Well, who did it help you build relationships with that have led to all this private negotiated work that you're doing right now? Well, mainly the realtors. Um, you know, they, they all trust me. They all have me stored in their phone. I'm the guy, you know, to do the inspections, especially I, I'm the only inspector that does commercial um, inspections in, in my town. So, you know, all these companies coming in, buying a commercial building, they want me to look at it, but then they're, they're also hiring me to improve the building or at least give me a chance to bid on it. Mm -hmm. Not always, it's not always a done deal, but more so than not. And, um, you know, getting in with the residential realtors and then the commercial realtors. I did a new build this year um, for a highway safety company that was out of Grand Rapids, two hours away. They, they bought a chunk of land from a commercial realtor that I'm in good, good with. And um, they didn't get other pricing. They just, you know, you start from the beginning with something like, the, I helped them everything, you know, I, I walked them right through the job, design, build, project, um, got the plans done, got the site site plan done, and um, they they didn't call any of my competitors, and, and that's, I think that's huge, but, you know, when my competitors drive by and see a vacant lot, and then my sign is up, they think, how did he, right? how did he even know about that job? So, right. Yeah, those those jobs they never show up on any sort of plan room bid board. There are no bid no. invitations that go out. It's the first time the public sees it. Or hears anything about it is when your sign goes up, which that's right. A, and it's that, and I never put a sign up until I have a signed contract. Yeah. That's a that's a number one rule of mine because you start talking about this stuff and then it it turns into another. Um, you know, then, then, then there's some competition usually. So yeah. word gets out. Yeah. That's, that's a smart move. So let's talk about that process. Um, let's say a corporate client, uh, somebody who has multiple locations, they are looking at space in, in your city. They contact mm -hmm. a broker. Well, you walk me yeah. through the process. Like at what point do you get involved? Just kind of walk through what that typical, process looks like from the time you get a call from a broker about an inspection to when you put your sign up. Okay. It, it's, there's a lot of different scenarios, but um, I'll use this miracle here, for example, um, that's a chain. So they, they have their own plans. Um, this guy, like I said, he owns seven or eight of them. Um, my realtor recommended or his realtor recommended me to do the work. He said he's the best in town. And, you know, you gotta take care of these people too. You gotta do a good job or the, the realtors are gonna quit, you know, recommending you of, of course, but because their name's on that too. So this uh, Miracle Ear guy called me and emailed me the plans. I gave him a price and and he said, that's 30% more than I'm used to paying. And it was a, it was a little bigger uh, square footage was a little bigger than he needed. So I explained that to him and, and he said, I don't mind paying the 30% more if you can get me in, in a month. Hmm. And that was, that was tough, but we did it. And, uh, he's happy because, you know, he's, he was already, he signed the deal. He's already leasing the, you know, every month <laughs> he's paying rent. So, um, not that I'm, you know, I don't gouge people at all. I just, if you want it in a month, it's going to cost a little more. And, and we did it for him and he was happy. He went, he's actually working on one, uh, an hour away from me now that he'd like me to do. So there's another relationship I built that, you know, now I'm a, a hearing aid specialist, <laughs> tenant improvement, but yeah, you're the, 
the Miracle Ear expert. Did, did that particular project have an inspection involved or was it, did you get involved when it was time to talk about fitting out the space? Uh, just when it was time to get fitting out the space, it was you know, 1500 square feet, just a typical strip mall, um, pretty much wide open. So we, um, he had plans that, you know, fit the space that Miracle Ear has their own architect and everything. So uh, they, they went down. But I also saved him a lot of time. Um, he'd call me from two hours away and said, hey, are you close to that? You, is your office close to that, you know, where I'm going to do the build out? Could you go measure a few things for me? Of course I would do that because um, saves him a trip, gets my foot further in the door with him. Um, sometimes you got to do that, those kind of things. Even the sign, the, the pylon sign out, uh, out front, he asked me to stop by and measure that so he could get a sign made that slipped into the, you know, where the other tenants were. Um, yeah. He didn't know the size of that. So just taking care of things like that for him, but, you know. So this is a um, little different. Private clients are very different from, well, private and or small business owner clients are very different from government or corporate clients. With mm -hmm. government, it's all about low price, lots of procurement guidelines, stat, right. fat contracts, and you know all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. What are the keys? What, what's most important to the the Miracle Ear client and clients like him who are doing tenant improvement fit out projects? What what are the things that are most important to them? I think the most important thing to this one was timing. Mm -hmm. he, he did not want to pay another month's rent and not, not be making profit. So we promised it, we delivered it. Um, and then, like I said, he was two hours away, but when he, he never came to the project at all until it was done. And I've still never met him in person to, believe, to be honest with you. I've just really? emailed and talked to him on the phone several times. But he came down there one day when I wasn't around and he, he did call me and say, that's the best build out he's ever done or ever had done for him. So he said, I see why you cost a little more, but um, he said that the workmanship was spot on. He just, he couldn't believe it, you know? So, but we not, you know, we, we got him in on time, but we also delivered a, a very nice product for him. Yeah. Um, so that brings up a, a unique situation. You have a client that's a couple of hours away. How do you, what tools do you use or what, um, what methods do you use to keep them up to date with, with what's going on? How do you, because here's what I found in a vacuum of information, clients get kind of squirrely sometimes if they're, mm -hmm. if they're not kept up to date, they get a little insecure. They assume bad things are happening. So how do you, how do you keep a client, happy and confident when they're not around? Well, communication. Um, there's several ways to do it, as you know. Um, this guy was big on email and, and uh, he asked me to just text him pictures and stuff once in a while. And, and I did. And um, we just signed up for Builder Trend not too long ago. And haven't that, that this was after that project. So I didn't use that with that one, but this one just wanted communication. And once in a while he'd call me and say, Hey, are we on schedule to, and I just told him yes. And I'd send him some pictures and I, I think communication is huge, no matter what method there's all kinds of methods, but I, I think um, with builder trend or some of the other ones out there, I think that's where I'm, I'm going to keep my side of it more consistent. It's really pretty much different with every client. And what I've always done is I, I try to communicate the way they'd like me to, if they're comfortable with email, I'll do that or calls or, or whatever. But um, sometimes some of that stuff is nice for me, but it, it scares some of the clients too. They don't know how to use it or don't take time to use some of those tools. But like I said, in the future, I'm going to be more consistent on my end. Um, so everyone's getting the kind of the same feedback from me. Yeah, I think the uh, have it, the Burger King approach to communication, which is have it your way is, is good. 
because I, I've seen people try to try to shoehorn clients into a specific method. Like, yeah, we, you, you need to go, if you want an update, you have to sign into our special FTP mm -hmm. share file site, scroll through folders, find the right folder, find the right date, download it. And they're just not going to do that. Um, right. And pictures, the old saying is true. A picture is worth a thousand words. So if you, I what I found that. is I, I put together really detailed reports and people typically just flip to the pictures. They want to see what's going that's, on. That's true. Yep. Um, so relationships with brokers seem to be the, the real linchpin here. How, if well, I get this question from a lot of people, um, how do I get into commercial work? I want to do, private. I would love to do commercial fit out work. And my advice to people is go develop relationships with brokers because they are, mm -hmm. they have the inside track mm -hmm. on these. So what advice would you give someone who wants to develop relationships with brokers? How would you, what would you advise them to do to go about doing that? Well, just, um, first of all, you got to meet them and, get to know them and, and build their trust. Um, you know, make them look good. Um, uh, like you, you said at the, the advance, be, be the easy button. People don't want to, you know, if they recommend someone, they want to look good too. So, um, and, and you have to adapt. Not every person's the same. You, you've got to, um, different brokers are all different. So I guess, kind of find, ask them what they're looking for. What could I do? What could I do to make you more successful? Um, help them, you know, help them out. They'll help you out. I mean, that's the way it works. Um, I guess, ask them what they're, what they'd like to see with, you know, form a team. That's what I'm, I'm big on that. Let's, let's form a team here and, and we're, you know, make us both successful. Yeah. I like that form a team and I've actually worked with um, I've worked with, I was with a real estate developer for about th three years, maybe a little over three years. And there was one broker, one guy who was responsible for somewhere North of a hundred million dollars of work that we did just in that three year period. Mm. That guy's a rainmaker. And he explicitly <laughs> said, he, he didn't leave it up to, the imagination. He, he specifically said, make me look good. Mm -hmm. And as long as we made him look good, mm -hmm. he would keep bringing us to the table. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure if it went the other way, he would go find somebody else. Sure. So that is fantastic advice. Make me look good. And here's, here's one thing I've learned. I, I've worked with I don't know, probably a dozen brokers and they are like the really successful brokers. They're deal makers. They are right. all about relationships and selling. And a lot of them are not detailed people. They're not right. and in a lot of cases. Very, I'm not sure. I can't think of any right now that are construction people. So there's this divide between the way, well, let me put it this way. If you approach them like a construction person and you think they care about all the stuff you care about, all the details of the project, their eyes are going to glaze over. You're going to lose them. Mm -hmm. um, they operate at a very high level. And mm -hmm. um, if you need to understand where they're coming from to develop relationships with them, they don't want to know about all the details. They don't want to look at specs. They don't want to look at details like, is my client happy? Are you on schedule? Are we on budget? Am I going to look good? Mm -hmm. Check. All right. That's all I need to know. So, um, any other advice for, well, you mentioned meeting them. How would you suggest somebody go about getting introduced to or meeting brokers? Is it networking events? Is it just stopping by their office? Where would you suggest um, somebody wants to get started doing that? Networking events are good. Um, I've reached out to a few and just offered to take them to lunch and told them what I can do for them and showed them some projects I've done. And, and, uh, it's worked. It's, uh, you know, tell them you can make them look good. We can, we can 
we can grow their, our businesses together. And um, most of them like that, you know. I, I mean, who wouldn't like that? That's the way I look at it. If someone came to me and, and to, wanted to take me to lunch and had something to offer for me, I, I would, I'd be all ears. Yeah. yeah. So, and just do what you say you're going to do for them. Just be honest with them. And, yeah, I, I don't think you can go wrong if you do those two things. Yeah. Um, and based on conversations we've had in the past, I know you have good relationships directly. You have great relationships with brokers, but then also you, you have clients who are doing repeat projects with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have relationships with business owners. Um, mm -hmm. How do you, what's your approach to developing and maintaining relationships with those kind of people? Like the, maybe they're, uh, car dealership owners or doctors or uh, people who actually own the building? Well, um, this one particular doctor that I, I did a, a build out for him, he bought a, an old building and we, we gutted it. Um, he, was, he was with a network of other doctors at the time, so he wanted to go start his own practice. So he purchased this building. I did the inspection for him. <laughs> And, and said, hey, we, this is the type of work I do. He called me. He didn't know I did con construction work at the time. This was about five years ago. And I did the inspection for the building he was purchasing. And I said, hey, this is, this is right up my alley if you're going to put your practice in here. And I, I've done other medical stuff. And so he, he didn't get any other pricing. He hired me to do it. And we got him in on time again. And developed a great relationship. Uh, we're, we're good friends now. And he called me this summer. It's funny. He called me. I don't do any residential work, but he was putting a pool in at his house. And I, he asked me to build his pool house for him. And I said, Brad, I, I don't do residential, but for you, I will. So we, we built this elaborate pool house for him. And he was kind of dangling a carrot because this building, when we built his practice out, he's the only doctor there. Well, he's hired another physician. So he was dangling a carrot saying, you know, we've got phase two coming up. And why wouldn't I say yes? To, you know, of course, I'm going to say yes to building a pool house for him. Mm -hmm. So, and he trusted me, you know, I did good on his office. So why wouldn't I do good at his house? So very small project for me but kind of a, you know, kind of a pain to be honest, but I'm looking further ahead than this miserable pool house is going to lead to another nice build out for this doctor who's a great guy. So I just did it for him. Yeah. And that's, so here's a, this brings up a question. Um, is there, is there a line between contractor and client? You know, some people would say, well, you got to maintain some healthy distance separation and uh, it's okay to tell these clients like, no, we don't do that. Um, what are your thoughts on becoming, being friends with your clients? Is that a good thing? Is it fraught with peril? What do you think? I think it's a good thing. Um, I've had good, good luck with it. Um, some of the, the large commercial companies I've worked for is a, I was a project manager for two companies before I went on my own. But uh, um, I always had good reviews and, you know, when it came time for evaluations and stuff, but the number one complaint at both companies was I was too nice. Mm. And they wanted a bulldog, I guess. And, and I'm not, I don't like confrontation. I don't know anyone that does, but being nice and working through problems has gotten me further along in my business than being a bulldog, I believe. Um, you know, sometimes I've, I've taken a hit on a job probably because I'm too nice. And, and But if they look at it like it's my fault, I'm going to take care of it. But it's always, I'm looking at the future too. You know, sometimes you have to take a hit here and there and, and be nice. Um, I, I just think it's, gotten me further along than arguing all the time with everybody. Now I can argue I, and I can be a bulldog when I need to be, but 
Um, if there's a certain client that is just always arguing, I just, you can fire clients too. You know, yeah. you don't, they don't have to be your client anymore. So if the same with subcontractors, if, if I'm constantly arguing with a subcontractor on every project, I just take them off my list. It's not worth it to me. It's, there's other great subcontractors or, and clients out there to use. Um, why put yourself through that misery? That's the, the, the number one thing I hate about public work is sometimes you have to work with a miserable client because they were low bid. Um, you had to use them because it was, a, or you wouldn't have got the project. And you know as well as I do, one lousy subcontractor can ruin a whole project. So yeah, it, it yeah, it doesn't matter how good if you've got a bad electrician or a bad HVAC guy or a bad drywaller. Well, there's a lot of them. It throws one, your whole schedule off if they're behind or it's just, you know, not showing up or doing lousy work. Yeah. It just it's not worth it. So. That's I've got a list of good clients and good, good subcontractors. And that goes back to like your question is being friends with them. It's, it's building a team. Like I said, you know, the clients on the team too, you know, and so are the subcontractors. So let's make this fun. That's, that's the way I look at it. Let's make it fun. Why do we got to argue about everything? Let's, let's be friends here and get this thing done together. So that, yeah, that's a great approach there's this, well, I came up in the commercial and there was a, I don't know that it was ever explicitly taught, but there was this division between the different groups. Mm -hmm. right? We're the general contractor. And then over on the other side, the other part of the pie chart is the architect. And then the other part of the pie chart is the, the client. And then there's the subcontractors and we're all like trying to, get a bigger piece of the pie. We're all adversarial. Right. And I guess if you go into it, assuming it's going to be adversarial, then it's going to be adversarial. But if you mm -hmm. go into it with the approach of, Hey, we're, we're all on the same team here and we're trying to figure mm -hmm. this out together. That, uh, that works a lot better. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a whole different mindset. And yeah, I've, I, I couldn't agree more and your clients are going to feel it. Your subs are going to feel it. Um, right. You know, right now, I tell people this is a this is a tough market to find good subs, and they can pick whoever they want to work with for the most part, right. but especially the good ones. Maybe not mm -hmm. all of them. So, if you want to have a competitive advantage, then take take good care of those subcontractors. Treat them sure. like almost like customers, because yes. in a way, you are you are. Uh, they are a customer and sure. uh, they're a real competitive advantage for you. So oh, I, I love that. Let's, let's form yeah, that, a team. That works both ways with the subcontractors too. Um, I, uh, I'm known for paying everyone. As soon as I get a check for a project, I pay all my subcontractors that, that same day or the next day. Hmm. Um, why hold their money for 30 days? Why, you know, a lot of these guys are mom and pop, you know, two man shows or they need the money, but that's also helped me build trust with them. They know they're going to get paid on my projects soon. And they've, they've even told me, a lot of them have told me they'll, they've left other projects to come and get mine done because they know they're going to get a check. And if they finish my, one of my competitors jobs, if they're on that project, they know they have to wait 30 or 60 or 90 days. So they're going to show up at my projects and get mine done. Um, but it's, you know, friendships and teams and relationships. What, you know, I, I expect to be paid when I'm done working for somebody. So why wouldn't they, you know? So, yeah, I, uh, I believe I'm treating my subcontractors as like gold because they're very, without them, I, I couldn't, I, with one employee, I can't do all this work. So yeah, I need those subs. So, yeah, those are, well, those are two unconventional things right there. Like let's treat subs like gold. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people could be scoffing at that idea right now, but that's, you're sure. right. You're exactly right. And then pay, pay your subcontractors quickly. Let's not stand on the heads of our trade partners. And that's, that's going to pay off for you. Now that's, right. I know I, 
I, I know a lot of people who talk about, you know, let's manage your accounts receivable, accounts payable, and you know, work some ratio to your favor, but that is to the detriment of subcontractors. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's a great, great strategy. Build trust. As soon as I get paid, you're going to get paid. And that, sure. that goes a, a long, long yeah, it, way. And sometimes it, it helps me too. If, if, if a client is slow on paying me, um, the subs understand because they know on every project I pay them quickly. And so if and I, and communication's big too, because I'll, I'll call the plumber and say, hey, look, I, I can't pay you as quickly as normal right now, but I still need this done. And he still shows up and gets it done because it, I've built this relationship with him where he knows if I could pay him, I would. So, you know, it, it, the trust is huge. You know, if they trust me, they're gonna show up and work and get it done for me because they know they're gonna get their money and, usually very quickly, but sometimes they might have to wait 30 days or so, but uh, they always do get paid and they know that. So they, you know, they, they're working hard for the team is the way I look at it. Yeah. No, I, I love that, that whole philosophy. Um, so let's talk about, um, we can talk about business development strategies all day long, but I, I think we've hit the big ones really. It's relationships, build trust, find the right brokers if you want to get into commercial work of course mm -hmm. depending on if you, let's let's say you wanted to do residential work then there's probably some other type of referral partner um, I, I want to ask one of my favorite questions here in a minute which is what was your most expensive mistake but before we get into that um, why why don't you do residential why have you chosen to focus on commercial well, I, I love commercial work. I like everything about it. Um, I've <laughs> had a big taste of both, but uh, residential projects are typically uh, more of a pain. Uh, you're, you know, you get all your, your walls roughed in and then the homeowners will show up or a wife or somebody will want a wall moved an inch and it's like, you know, it's already drywalled. Um, you brought up the story about dust on the mm. dining room table or whatever it was. And yeah. It, it just seems like it's, it's honestly more work for less money. And I, I'd rather deal with a client that wants to get in their facility and start making money than one that is going to live in it for the next 30 years. And argue about everything and they a lot of residential people think contractors are um, crooked too so yeah i you know some of the bad ones out there have ruined that for everybody but um yeah i'm, I'm with i i just like the commercial work a lot better yeah yeah the, the story about uh my story if somebody asks me like well todd why do you prefer commercial work and, and my response is typically i have never sat at a dining room table on a Sunday afternoon and had a commercial client crying about dust on her windows. <laughs> sure. Now, has that happened on a residential project? Yes. <laughs> and I am just, just, that's not my thing. I'm glad there are people doing residential work, but, uh, <laughs> right. That, that, that's my experience. Um, yeah. So, Okay, so now let's talk about mistakes. What okay. what is your m most expensive slash most educational mistake so far? Well, I uh, I grew up working for for my dad. He was a residential builder. We did a few light commercial projects, and then I I got my builder's license at twenty two years old, and then I I just my father and I weren't getting along. It's hard to work for family, but I went out and started my own business at 23 years old and I was doing great. I was building houses. I was building decks. I was siding houses, putting in replacement windows. I was making money. I had uh, four people working full time for me and I, I loved it. I was doing great. And I built this two story house for this guy 
and he bought all the material luckily but during the the house i uh, had it all roughed in dried in a uh, big wrap around porch on it it was a, a really big house he went through a divorce during this process and the you know i was i was probably 27 at the time 28 and his the land that the house was built on was his wife's name um they they were having problems he he didn't pay me Mm. he i got hit for twenty five thousand dollars at 27 years old so um and it boiled down to contract i had uh those uh office (laughs) um triplicate uh boilerplate contract i guess you know and had him sign it there again i just trusted him and um so i hired an attorney and you can't get blood out of a turnip my attorney and i couldn't afford to keep fighting this guy so i just that's what that mistake was huge but it it led me to i stuck it out another year got every all my people paid off and everything and got back on my feet a little bit but i decided to go work for somebody and i, I only planned on going to work for someone for a year or two and going back on my own um health benefits everything was appealing to me at that time and i was i was pretty mad at everybody at that point in my life but uh um but that led me to work for this pretty big commercial company and that's really where i fell in love with commercial work and i stayed there for nine years and then went to another company for four years and then that's the one I was traveling all the time and that I went on my own. So I had 13 years of great education and a lot of it was contracts and legal stuff. So I wouldn't make that mistake again today, but it's a learning process. Yeah. It puts you, puts you on the path. To get sure. You are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so you said, you got screwed over I and mean, let's, let's be honest, you got screwed and you said you were pretty mad at everybody. How did you, how'd you kind of work through that? Cause you don't seem like a mad guy now, but how did you, <laughs> maybe you are, oh, maybe, I was mad you know, then. Maybe you all keep it all <laughs> stuffed down inside, but, uh, yeah. Around you. Well, I, I asked my attorney if I could go tear the house down and he said, no, it's his. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> He said, you can't damage anything. And I said, what if I take a, a pry bar and a, a cat's paw and pull yeah. every nail out of that thing and stack the lumber up nice and neat and let him rebuild it again? He said, you could probably do that. Yeah. I I didn't do that. I've thought of taking shingles and windows and um, <laughs> things, taking concrete. Of course, it's hard to take concrete back, but uh, I, I thought of disassembling stuff that people didn't pay me for. So, yeah. But how did sure. you... How'd you deal with that being mad at the whole world and kind of get, put that behind you? Well, um, my wife was pregnant with my first child at the time. And, um, like I said, I loved owning my own business, but I was mad. And, um, I thought this, this job with a a child on the way and and good insurance and uh, allow my wife to stay at home. And it was a, I just, it was appealing to me at that time. And that, I guess that's how I dealt with it. I just, I, and I don't like to owe people money. So that, that big hit at 27, 28 years old was, that's a lot of money now. So that was, uh, you know, I, I did owe the, you know, that put me behind on other projects I was doing too. So not getting $25,000 that I was expecting. Mm-hmm. So I, I basically stayed in business for that last year just to keep working and get everyone paid for, you know, there again, communication's the key The the lumber yard, I owed money. I, I called them and told them the problem. And I said, I know you weren't involved in the project, but you know, it's put me behind and um, I'll make out a payment plan with you. And I did and got everyone paid. And then I just, I just went and got another job because it was appealing at the time. And, um, as you know, owning your own business can be very stressful. So I didn't need any more stress in my life at the time. And I'm glad I've made that move and glad it put me on this path because it's worked out well for me. And there again, back to relationships, um, working for those commercial companies, 
is where I met a lot of these great commercial subcontractors and I always treated them right when I was a, a worker, a project manager, I always treated them right. And they followed me from one company to the next company and now they followed me from those company, companies to my own company. So um, this goes back 20, 25 years. So um, those relationships I built working for those two companies have been huge. And I never saw that coming, to be honest with you. I just, just the kind of person I am. I try to treat people right, and it usually comes back to you one way or another. Yeah. Yeah, that um, kind of reminds me of, of my story. Years ago, I got screwed over when I had my own business, made some mistakes, shut it down. That put me on a different path. And every time I've gone through some adversity, which really sucked while I was in it, <laughs> looking back on it, I realized it, that was a turning point and I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't know what I know or wouldn't know who I know and wouldn't, sure. wouldn't be the person I am today without that adversity. So right. if it's any encouragement, if you're listening and you're in the middle of some adversity, then you're listening to a couple of guys who've been through some stuff and you'll get through it. Um, it'll, it'll make you better. And it could very well be the thing that puts you on the right path. So I'm certainly not suggesting you go looking for adversity, but if you're in the middle of it, there's, <laughs> you have the opportunity to, to make something good happen from that. Um, so one thing I, I made a note of that I want to make sure we hit on is um, you have, you have one employee, your project manager slash superintendent slash home inspector. What, what are the keys to being able to hire um, and make somebody like that successful to the, the person who was where you were, the one man show before you brought him on board? What advice would you give them for making, for finding that person and then making it work? Well, I, I got lucky with him, I think, but I, I did, uh, he was a mutual, we had a mutual friend and I, I called this mutual friend and asked, um, he owns a, a manufacturing facility. But one thing I noticed about my friend was every employee I know that worked for him was a top notch guy. And I said, man, you really hire some great people. If you ever know anyone that has a construction background send them my way because I'm looking for a guy and he didn't even hesitate. He gave me Andy's name and uh, we met for dinner a couple times and uh, we kind of hit it off and I just kind of drove him around to some job sites and showed him how I did things. And like I said, he was a commercial carpenter at the time and um, he liked the kind of projects I was doing and he, he wasn't happy where he was at. And, uh, I got lucky really. And, um, but I, I did my homework too. I was looking for someone like me. I wanted another me and he's, he's pretty close to that. So, um, treat him right. He treats me right. And, uh, he, I think he really likes what he's doing and he's learned a lot. And I've learned a lot from him too. I mean, he's, he's a great carpenter and, and problem solver. So, um, I don't know. He just, uh, it worked out and, uh, he, he'd never thought about being a home inspector or anything. And he likes doing that too. So. So when you brought him on board, how did you, um, after doing everything yourself for so long, how did you delegate to him? Was there, did you find some things that worked well or things that didn't work well when you, as you brought him on board and you began delegating tasks to him? Well, like I say, he was, he was pretty computer literate for, um, literate. Uh, he was good. I mean, um, but he didn't, he never worked in an office. So, um, he caught, he's smart. He caught on quick. Um, the first six months was, I knew he wasn't, you know, now I have overhead, you know, I'm paying this guy. He's not, he's not really doing anything for me, but I want him to get to the point where he is. So he shadowed me. We went on inspections. We visited, he went everywhere with me, lunch, 
we just uh, went everywhere together and I just wanted some of me to rub off on him, I guess. Um, you know, I didn't sit down and say, this is the way it's going to be, or I, he just kind of looked at how I did things and it, that's the way he does things now. So, um, and he's, he's come up with some good ideas too that uh, I never thought of, you know, he's like, why, why don't we do it this way? And I'll, I'll either say, no, that's absurd or that's a great idea. Let's, let's do that. So we bounce stuff off each other all the time. And he's, uh, he likes being in the field. He likes being in the office. He likes the home inspection. So I think that that appeals to him too, because he's not just framing walls all day or yeah. you know, hanging grid ceilings or um, he's out and about and he's, you know, he's, he treats the subs like I do too. So, you know, he's, he's on the right path. He fits in good with my company. Yeah. So it goes back to relationships started off with sure. you tapped relationships to find Andy and then you developed a relationship with Andy and then decided to work together. And then I, I think your approach, I guess some would call it like the apprenticeship approach. Like, Hey, you just follow me around and watch help and absorb. And then um, you'll, you'll be just like Toby. And I think that's, that's a great way. A lot of people don't take that kind of time and they just, throw somebody out there and say, okay, you're a project manager, go, uh, go manage projects. And then they're disappointed that they don't manage projects because they've mm -hmm. been given too much leash. So now that's, that, that's great advice. Um, so let's see here. We are running up against time. I want to be cognizant of your time. Let's see. Um, all right. So you've got, got an audience of a bunch of construction business owners and leaders. What, um, what advice would you give to them? Like if you've got a you have 60 seconds to give them some advice that you feel really passionate about and you believe they need to hear it, what would that be? Um, teamwork. Uh, treat, treat your projects more like a, like you're all on the same team, subcontractors, architects, clients, get everyone involved, uh, treat them right. And I, I think that you'll find that that comes back to you. I think people will treat you right in turn. So, um, and relationships, anytime you never know what the person you meet at lunch is, you never know what that could turn into. I've met people that I thought, you know, I, I meet them and then, you know, a month later they call me and it turns into a project or a, or something good, or they know someone that's going to do a project or I don't know. It's just uh, relationships and teamwork are my two big things. Yeah. Be I, honest with people. That's, you know, that's part of teamwork, but be honest and treat people the way you want to be treated. And I think it, it ends up paying off more so than not. You know, that sounds like a golden rule, you know, it's like just treat people like you want to be treated, do unto others, that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, somebody should it sounds write. simple, but it, it, it really does work. <laughs> it's, it's so powerful. Yeah. And you're right about relationships. I've had, uh, I, I worked with a guy in like 2006 on a project. We were in, we were in different cities. The project was in a different state. And then 2012, six years later, um, I got a message from him and I ended up, a, a job came out of it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's because we got along six years before. Right. So yeah, sure. relationships cannot be overemphasized. Um, so everybody, everybody you meet, if, if you treat everybody you meet like they're the most important person in the world, it's probably going to come back to you. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, so speaking of meeting, we met in person at the advance, which was, uh, we're recording this here in September, 2019, but we met in Fort Myers, Florida in April of 2019 and, and spent uh, a couple of days there. And the next advance is going to be coming up October 
17th in Lexington, Kentucky, October 17th of 2019. And whenever you're listening to this, there's probably going to be another one coming up, which there'll be a link at the end of this podcast where you can find out more about that. But um, share with folks, like, what was your experience like? What were, what was the, what were the big takeaways from the advance that you attended back in April? Well, I, I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, I was a big fan of your podcast. That's why I went. And I, when I got there, I immediately felt welcomed. Um, everybody, I thought it was great. Every, every person I met was great. I love all the stories. The, but the, the biggest thing I took away was, um, well, first of all, we, meeting everybody was great. But then when we left, and I'm sure you felt the same way, but I felt like I'd known some of those people for 10 years. Yeah. I mean, it really did. I, I felt a connection with all of them. But I thought it was neat to listen to your speakers and yourself. But some of the, the best stuff was just after the advance at dinner and yeah. out by the pool and uh, things like that. But um, just bouncing ideas off each other, trading stories. And I mean, you can, and helping each other. Um, you, you, you're all like-minded people that are business owners in the construction industry and you're you're sharing ideas with someone that's not going to compete against you they're they, they live far enough away and um i don't know it just it, it, some of the st strategies and the i don't know the ideas people have it's just i think it helped everyone there and probably yourself too i mean it, it just uh i don't know it was a big help it was fun it was i really enjoyed it and I, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Kentucky coming yeah. up here pretty soon. Yeah, it, uh, I, I was so, I wasn't surprised, but I guess I didn't really, I don't know, but I, I was really blown away by the generosity of people and how, mm -hmm. how interested everybody else was in everybody else, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I've been to some conferences where people come to the, the meeting room and then they just disperse and they're gone. And I didn't want that. I, I, I knew that the community component was huge. And in fact, before that event, somebody asked me, hey, is there going to be like a, a live web stream? And, and I hope to never do that for an advance. Right. Because if I did that, that would allow people, I would be causing people to miss out on what's probably the best part. I mean, I, yeah. I would like to say that the best part is the stuff that I'm talking about, but it's not. It's, it's good. It's the best stuff I got, but it's not the best part. The best part was the relationships. It was the mm -hmm. people sitting around at dinner talking about, Hey, I've got this issue and how would you deal with this? And somebody in a different industry from a different part of the country or even a different country saying, well, what about this? Have you thought about this? And mm -hmm. I, I was just, I was blown away by the, the generosity of and mm -hmm. and how how open everybody was um and it, people started to share like hey this is what i'm dealing with and i'm concerned about this um yeah so yeah it uh it was a lot of fun definitely and i am i'm really mm -hmm. excited about the next one so um yeah looking forward to, to seeing you in kentucky in a few weeks um so if if somebody's thinking about coming like what what advice would you give them? Like if they're like, eh, I'm not sure if it's worth it. What would you, what would you say to them? Well, I think it's totally worth it. And I don't, anyone that wants to, to grow their business or is stuck in a rut or anything like that. Um, I would recommend going because you're going to meet some great people. Here's some great speakers. And uh, you, you come back with a, you're just motivated. You're just, uh, I don't know. You come back with a whole new look on, you know, things I never thought of that, or I'm going to put this in place right away, or I don't know. It just, it gives you that. I think it's important to just hear other people's stories and ideas that it, it, good or bad, you can take it or, or leave it. But I, I think it's just so important. It, it gives you motivation. It, 
you realize that, you know, you're not the only one that was in a rut or are in a rut. Um, you've seen people that got out of their rut that makes you feel better. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I think it's great for anybody that's in the construction industry, good or bad, um, going good, still go because you can make it better. You can always make everything better. So, um, a lot of good, a lot of good stuff comes out of that and it's hard to really put it into one category, I guess, but it, you, you come back and you're, you're ready to grow your business or get out of that rut or whatever it is. But, um, I would highly recommend it to anyone listening that is in the construction industry that's thinking about going, you're going to meet some great people. I appreciate that. Um, okay. So, uh, we are running up against time here. Um, so if people want to connect with you, want to follow you on social media or check out your website, um, where, where's the best place for them to, well, first of all, what's the name of your company and then where can they find you out there on the interwebs? Jonesconstructionsolutions.com is my website. And, uh, I'm on Instagram, Jones Construction Solutions and on Facebook, Jones Construction Solutions. So pretty easy to find. Um, I, I pretty big on social media. I update my projects a lot, you know, a lot of good pictures on there. So, um, I follow a lot of other companies like myself too. And it's, it's fun to look at all that stuff, but that's where you can find me Jones construction solutions. Yeah. And you do a great job on social media, very consistent. Uh, and have you, have you seen a, a response like are you have you gotten business or relationships referrals from social media uh i have a few and uh a lot of it sometimes you feel like it's not working or whatever but all that stuff just um especially in my my town every time i run into somebody they say man you've got a lot of, lot going or i see your trucks everywhere my trucks i have one truck with my logo on it, but it <laughs> It's Andy's. He, you know, they see it around and they, they assume it's more than one truck because they see all these, every, every job site I have, I put a, a four by eight sign with my logo in front of it because it's just, I think it's important that people see that logo and that brand recognition and, you know, this fancy website and they probably think I have 50 employees or more, but I, I have one, but uh, I think it's just, important to do all that stuff. It is, it all kind of works together. Name recognition, brand recognition. Yeah. And so. uh, I've seen some pictures. There's a, uh, a breakfast place that you go to that has <laughs> coffee. Do you bring your own coffee mugs or did you provide logo Jones <laughs> construction solutions, coffee mugs? I provided coffee mugs. Just, just, so. just two of them or do you provide a bunch? I, I provided a bunch to that place because you're everywhere. That's why, why not? That's why people see your trucks everywhere. They're like, they're drinking their coffee. They're driving by, they're seeing these trucks. They're, it's a barrage sure. of information. That's cool. Sure. Yeah. Coffee cups, anything else you're doing that's uh, similar to the uh, coffee cup? A lot of the subcontractors like my hats. Um, I have some pretty nice hats that, and they're affordable, but that everyone likes them. So I, I just keep ordering them. But, um, you know, it's, it's funny to, I shouldn't say funny. Well, it is funny. Okay. To see a concrete crew with my hats on at a competitor's job site. Yeah. So, but I, I give them hats. I try to, you know, it's not just the owner of the subcontractor company. It's the workers too. treat them good. Mm. Give them some hats. You know, there, there might be, 10 square feet of sidewalk that they wasn't on the print that we needed extended for some reason. They just do it. You know, sometimes there's no change order that way. Um, you know, hats go a long way, donuts, whatever, whatever they like. Yeah. Hats, donuts, lunch, drinks every once in a while. Those are, sure. uh, those are good investments. Yeah. Sure. Well, that, that's great advice. Invest in your subcontractors. Um, it's amazing what a t-shirt, or a cool hat will do. Yeah. Sure. 
good stuff. Well, man, this has been fantastic. I, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to do this and share about relationships and growing your business, tons of actionable stuff. So thanks again. And I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks in Lexington. Okay. Looking forward to seeing you too. Thanks, Todd. There you go. Make sure and connect with Toby. See what he's doing on social media. He's doing a really good job. So go connect with him on social media. Go grab your field chat account at fieldchat.com slash edge and go sign up for the advance. You're not going to regret it. Go to constructionbusinessaccelerator.com slash advance to see if there are seats still available. But registration is going to close at the, at the latest, October 13th. And I'm actually offering a 10x ROI guarantee. So there's more details on my 10x, your return on investment guarantee when you attend the advance, but you're gonna walk away with strategies and actual words you can say, really practical things you can do that will help you sell more work at higher margins. So go to constructionbusinessaccelerator.com slash advance. And I hope to see you in Lexington, Kentucky. But do it quick before the seats are gone. And as always, I appreciate the ratings, the reviews, the notes, the messages. If you could leave a rating and a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, whatever it's called now, that would be fantastic. That helps get the word out there. And as always, thank you for listening. I will see you next time. <music>